And I would like to present our fantastic presenters, Jamie Strickland and Bill Garcia. They have written the chapter in our book, Students' Pathway to Success, a Faculty Learning Guide, and their chapter is on learning how to learn. This book is available to anybody on campus. Um, we will happily send you the link to find it later, but essentially the purpose of today's session is to just summarize the chapter, talk about what's going on in it, and that way you can ask some questions directly to the authors. So, Jamie and Bill, I'm going to let you take it away. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I think Bill is going to start this out with a, a little bit of an introduction. We're kind of going to go back and forth um, a little bit between um, the introduction and uh, the three main kind of points or questions that we pose uh, in developing this on learning how to learn. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Bill. Um, so when we were constructing writing this chapter, um, one of the big issues that we ran into was that sort of everybody kind of has a different idea of what learning how to learn actually means. And so we sort of settled on a definition that, that's uh, right up at the front of the chapter, um, that it's a process leading to change, which occurs as the result of experience and increases the potential for improved performance in future learning. And the the key idea that I think is in that quote is this idea of change and that learning essentially is any way in which someone changes either their opinion or their knowledge or how they uh, process, right, the, the structure of their process um, changes. Um, all of these things can be considered um, learning and in one chapter it's almost impossible to discuss every single aspect of a process as complicated as how people might change. And so we sort of focused on essentially three ways that faculty generally um, think about learning for, uh, in their students. And those three ways are sort of listed at the, the end of the introductory section. The first is the idea that um, as students progress in individual courses or in their college experience in Toto, uh, we'd like to get them to learn how to be a better student. Okay, so that was one of our goals. And so the first section um, in the chapter focuses on learning how to be a better student. Um, the second goal we had was, we identified, was that students learn how to inquire and construct knowledge. And so inquiry is a big um, uh, word that's throughout the general education curriculum here. It's also uh, a word that we see frequently in other curricula. Um, and so the idea there is it's not just about um, students gaining knowledge, but it's about how they build on knowledge they already have or they re um, construct ideas that they had previously and change those ideas. So that was our second uh, goal. And then the third one was uh, learning how to be a self-directed learner. Um, and this in some ways is one of the more important goals because ideally once our students uh, leave university uh, and move on to the rest of their life, they will have to learn things uh, that are not in an academic setting and they will have to be self-directed in that, um, whether it's in the workplace or in uh, social settings or in um, their interpersonal relationships. Um, we want them to be active in the inquiry process and a self-directed learner, so to speak. And so the rest of the chapter basically looks at ways that we can incorporate um, teaching students how to improve upon these three skills. Now there are uh, obviously other ways we can look at learning, um, but they are certainly well beyond the scope of a single chapter. Um, so the rest of the chapter essentially just gives guidelines and examples of things that we can do in courses that um, will aid in these three goals that we've identified. Um, uh, Jamie, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, but I realized that I messed up and you just did what I was supposed to do. I know, but I, <laughs> I ran with it. <laughs> Good man. That's why we can team teach. <laughs> so, um, so what we thought we would do for um, the next 10 or 15 minutes or so is break down the um, three goals that we set out in the introduction and just give one or two examples 
of ways in which um, in our courses we can uh, try to uh, improve on students' um, abilities. Um, now, some of the things we might mention are actually um, things that we do in our courses that are not specifically cited in the text. Uh, as I was reviewing the text um, last night, um, I came up with a number of examples of things that in JMAN I actually do in a team talk course um, that are not specifically listed on here. Uh, so we may actually delve into some of those things uh, in addition to what's actually in the text. Um, so, uh, Jamie, do you want me to do number one or do you want to do number one? Uh, let me go ahead since I messed up. Let, <laughs> let me go ahead and do number one. I'll leave inquiry for you. Um, but, you know, if we think about one of the things that um, our colleagues, Dan Boivai, um Beth Whitaker, and Jason Giersch, uh, who uh, were our co-authors on this particular chapter, uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we included here was um, you know, in part based on our own experiences in classrooms where uh, we realized that there were some uh, skills that um, as somewhat professional students ourselves, uh, we had honed over a number of years that our students didn't necessarily have. Um, so uh, several of those skills, we kind of came up with a uh, term and use, uh, use the term, uh, and you might have seen this in the chapter if you take a look at it, uh, they're gateway skills. So they include things like effective note taking, uh, reading comprehension, which happens to be my personal um, interest in a lot of things that, that I read about and try and understand in terms of learning how to learn, uh, purposeful, clear writing and speaking, so purposeful and clear communication skills, um, making connections um, as another very important skill for students to um, develop um, both within a course, so that we're looking at material maybe from one point in a semester to another, or uh, to be able to make transitions between what may seem to the student um, as, as less obvious connections, but to, to help students kind of work through that, but also across courses. Uh, and not just if you're dealing with, you know, courses that have prerequisites, um, but also within a particular curriculum. So I'm a geographer, and um, some of our courses um, it really feed into others, but don't necessarily serve as formal prerequisites. So we want them to be able to make those connections across uh, the, the curriculum as well as within a particular course. And all of this is something that um, many of us have kind of come to the realization that this is something that's important for us um, to help students move from more superficial types of learning material uh, that they may have employed at other points in their academic career toward deeper learning. And by deeper learning, I am referring to, to that kind of learning um, that we we not only have a greater level of understanding in the short term, but also kind of long-term impacts. And so uh, a few of us have been heavily impacted by um, writing from people like D. Fink, who uh, we cited in our chapter. And, and in particular, that really is a big part of his particular ideas about what learning how to learn means. So that this stuff is just as important as any content that we might share with our students as well. Um, there are a number of different strategies. So we, we tried to kind of provide definitions for folks who might read this, uh, but also to uh, try and uh, provide some strategies. So, um, you know, the, the term of curation has shown up a good bit uh, out there in both um, popular media, social media, uh, as well as in academic literature. Um, and so uh, we were thinking particularly in some of, some of the larger introductory classes, although this, this could translate across other settings as well, uh, but in larger introductory classes, um, you know, we might want to, um, you know, encourage students to take notes as something of an artifact um, of, of the class, right? So um, similar to assignments that we might have um, and, and, and kind of review them, go over them, um, and get a sense of 
how this is fitting in with their understanding within the course as well as um, you know how can we uh, um, get students to see where they might be missing some material. Uh, so we can use this in conjunction with exams, for example, uh, in order to try and um, help students see that there is, there is in fact a purpose to this thing that we call note taking and it's not just an old fashioned or quaint notion. Um, uh, we also uh, offered a strategy for um, pairing students together um, and kind of having students go through a process of seeing how different different people are taking in different, the, essentially the same information that's being presented, right, and how are they making sense of it. Um, so a lot of this is uh, influenced by some of us who uh, are very interested in making our, our thinking as well as our students' thinking much more visible to one another. And I'm going to go go ahead and stop there for the moment. <laughs> um, and so, one thing that uh, I just want to reiterate that um, Jamie indicated as she was talking about that that sort of first um, section of learning how to learn is that a, a lot of the things that are in the chapter and that we're going to talk about are largely context dependent. And what I mean about by context dependent is what's going to work in a large class may not work necessarily work in a small class and vice versa. And what we've tried to do um, with all of these sections is outline a number of things that, that can be done um, and then either they can be retrofit to the class that you're teaching or you, know, you can pick and choose amongst the options. Um, you know, so for example, what works in a 150 seat class of freshmen may not work in a 30 seat class of uh, capstone seniors, for example. Um, so just just to sort of reiterate some of the things that Jamie said. Um, so the second section um, of the chapter looked at sort of learning how to inquire and construct knowledge. And um, one of the things that makes um, learning inquiry difficult is that inquiry differs depending upon your discipline. So for example, um, I'm a geologist and you know most of my training is in geology and biology classes and to our, our um, natural science classes, we're steeped in scientific methodology and we think of that as the inquiry process. And um, that process may work slightly differently um, in engineering or uh, the arts or the humanities. Um, but at their core, all of these ideas, or all of these, excuse me, not ideas, but um, versions of inquiry um, have at their heart question asking and, and attempts to answer or to explore particular ideas or questions. And so I think all of the um, concepts that we've um, laid out in this section can be adjusted to fit the particular type of inquiry that um, a course is um, involved with. Um, one of the key ideas that run throughout a lot of these particular techniques is the idea that students come in with certain background knowledge, and in some cases that background knowledge is well constructed, in some cases it's not so well constructed, but the process of inquiry involves students looking at the knowledge they have, assessing it, asking questions based upon that knowledge, and then reformulating their knowledge and their um, sort of uh, knowledge constructs through the process of asking questions and attempting to answer them. So a lot of these techniques start with a way to get students to talk about what they know or what they think they know. So for example, if you look at things like, um, oh, where are we here? Um, you can apply a lot of these one word summaries at the beginning of class instead of at the beginning. So one of the things that Jamie and I do in our team taught um, prospect for success class is often at the beginning of class we survey students, we give them a quote or um, an idea and we ask them to um, pick one word that describes that quote or that idea and we generate a word cloud and we use that word cloud as a spur for a discussion of that particular topic and then at the end of class we may ask them to do the same thing after we've lectured or after they've had an assignment about 
um, that particular topic. And it's interesting to see how those ideas change through um, the exploration of their prior knowledge, the lecture, and then their knowledge on the back end. Um, many of the techniques in this chapter, in this section, talk about back end applications, but I think the front end is also relatively important. It's sort of uh, showing the students how their knowledge has changed throughout um, uh, a, a particular lecture or a particular classroom experience. Um, the other thing, and this is an example of something that um, I do in one of my classes is that um, students often think of the scientific method or the general inquiry process as having a start point and a finish point where um, there's a question or hypothesis, it's tested, it's answered, and you end up more knowledgeable out the back end. But what they don't think about is the idea that this is actually um, an iterative and repetitive process. In, it's more circular than it actually is linear. And so one of the things that, that I've started doing in classes is presenting them with um, theory or process knowledge that's 10 years out of date. And I give them an assignment based upon that theory or process knowledge and they come up with an answer. And then at the beginning of the next class, I present them with the new theory or process knowledge from the last 10 years and tell them to go back and revisit what they did in the last class, which sort of mimics the uh, process of in the scientific method testing and re-establishing and re-writing um, our hypotheses when we're confronted with new information. Um, in that way, they're sort of steeped in the actual process that's going on and they can sort of see how we have to change our knowledge constructs when we acquire new information. Um, and I think while these ideas are difficult to implement, um, in large classes, it's not impossible. Um, for example, a lot of the um, new classroom uh, management software, uh, things like Socrates and Top Hat, um, allow you to very quickly uh, survey students either through uh, a single word uh, answers or short answers, maybe sentences or two that can be easily um, processed by graduate students or even the instructor if the uh, instructor wants to sift through that material. Um, but it allows you to look at students' prior knowledge and then see how their um, knowledge has changed uh, through uh, the course of a particular lesson or, or multiple lessons. Um, but again, what I, I think we stress in this section is that um, you sort of have to get the students to think about what they know at the beginning. Uh, generally, students think of uh, learning and, and knowledge construction as um, I'm taught things and I add that to a pile of knowledge instead of um, I have knowledge at the beginning and then new knowledge alters my um, my opinions and my views. Um, it's sort of a, a, a shaping process rather than simply an additive process. Um, so uh, Jamie, do you want to take over? Sure. Um, so the learning how to learn, excuse me, the learning how to be a self-directed learner uh, segment, um, you know, in a lot of ways, these are, uh, there's a lot of interconnections amongst these topics. Um, but we, what we were particularly interested in trying to capture here was how can we get our students to be um, both more active participa participants in uh, directing their own um, learning and you know how can we help to model that in some way? And um, how can we move from an expectation that um, within a classroom where um, I need to be told everything from my instructor and that I have no decision-making power, I have no uh, ability to come up with my own uh, learning goals, for example. So um, we really focus quite heavily on, on um, goal assessment and achievement. Uh, in this particular segment. And uh, one of the things that I'll just kind of mention quickly that I do use in um, some of my classes, uh, particularly one that I teach in our active learning classrooms. Um, I, one of the courses I teach is on world food problems and I have moved that toward more of an inquiry-based learning class over time so that there's le less and less direct instruction on my part and more of an inquiry uh, process in um, kind of knowledge gathering, discovery, and construction 
uh, for the students. And that requires them to make some decisions, right? Um, and so I have uh, started using, uh, you can call them a number of different things. You can call them learning logs, um, inquiry logs, journals, um, what have you. And we have some examples of those um, that deal more generally with um, study skills, study habits, um, and kind of the, the bigger picture elements of, of what it means to uh, direct our own learning. Um, but I find that, you know, this also pairs with this notion of um, making our, our thinking visible to ourselves and to others. Um, within, these, within these journals, I try to provide um, not only a space, but also some gentle guidance on how, how can we begin to make um, goals for ourselves about the kinds of things that we need to accomplish within the course, um, within the particular um, inquiry framework that we're working in. Um, you know, what does that mean in terms of um, what I'm responsible for, what other people are responsible for? Um, and what I find is that while they're doing this as part of an assignment, and this is something that I do look at, um, that those kinds of um, really uh, metacognitive kinds of, of uh, processes, they're paying attention to that outside of the framework of a particular assignment. So they're applying it to other elements of a class, other elements um, within their you know, university uh, schedule for, for that particular semester. Um, so, you know, I think ultimately what we were thinking about is how can we help people become lifelong learners, right? Uh, and so this was, this was the way in which we tried to frame that. Okay. Um, and just because I'm me, I'm time sensitive, um, I know that we're, uh, I want to make sure that we leave some time for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and stop at that point. Alrighty, so we've come to our portion where we can ask some questions. Again, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them or um, go ahead and type them in the chat. We can read them out loud, whatever method you prefer. All right, Bobby? Oh, I like the little hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, huh? <laughs> you can click the hand, then I know to to look at you. Yeah, I, and and I could ask much easier than I could type. Um, first of all, <laughs> thank you both, um, Bill and Jamie, for this. I think this is such an important discussion um, that I wish you know more of us as faculty across the campus could have. You probably mm -hmm. should have gotten better presenters, though. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, come on! Are you kidding me? Not at all. Not at all. But my, my question to, to the both of you was that, um, and my apologies if, if you mentioned this at one point, but in your classes, do, do you notice a real range, a real disparity uh, in terms of students who, who come with good study mm. skills, both metacognitive and, and other types of, and content specific study skills, and then those who just seem to, to flounder and, and uh, need a lot of handholding? Um. Oh yes, <laughs> just in, in a word, yes. I, I think we do see a lot of disparity. Um, to a certain extent, it, at least um, you know from from my take on this, uh, sometimes it's a little more glaring if we're, let's say, in our prospect for success class. Yeah. Um, the the disparity may seem. Well, actually, uh, let me take that back. There's a I. I our experience has been there's a, a pretty sizable percentage that seem to um, have a realization, particularly after the first exam, that whatever they did in high school doesn't work now. And that, you know, it, that's not a statement about high school. It's just a statement, I think, about them and, and how they think about learning. Um, and then I see some others that are actually quite, you know, quite good. Um, so that's that's my quick thing, Bill. Um, I would I would sort of second some of what Jamie said. I would say uh, because Jamie and I both teach a lot of intro level, thousand level classes, and we teach the prospect class that's first semester freshman. I would say the biggest disparity we see is in that prospect class, first semester freshman, where we see the gambit between students who, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, have no study skills. Um, 
and then we see some who have pretty good study skills. And I would also second what Jamie said that the other big disparity is in a recognition during their first semester that they need to change. Um, so I would say that very few students come in with great study skills, but a significant number of students realize during their first semester that they need to improve. But there's also a significant uh, proportion of students who come in with poor study skills and it takes them a very long time to recognize that they need to change, um, which are the toughest students to, um, to help because you know, nobody's going to change until they realize they actually need to change. Yeah, I, I think the reason this is so fascinating to me is because, I mean, I'm, I'm keenly aware, you know, that uh, not all high schools and not all K-12 preparation is equal. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, students can, can be admitted to the university, you know, based on the criteria that are part of that application process. But then once they get into your classes, you know, you have to contend with um, those students who, who have the skills and can apply them and those who don't. And one of the things I wonder about, too, is I feel like some of our students, maybe they've been taught some of these skills, but something that you said, Jamie, made me think of this, and that is I don't know that they, uh, that they think about those skills that, oh, yeah, I, I know this, and I can apply this in this context. You see what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like oh, yes. They their learning seems to be so contextual, and I think maybe that's been an ongoing challenge for us in education, is how do we help students make those connections? Yes, I, I would agree. And I, and I think that's, um, that's one of the things that I'm particularly interested in now, um, and that I realize, you know, I've, when I first started doing this stuff, I, I saw my job as, as a teacher, but really, it was really a content deliverer, you know? And now I see my role much more as um, how can I help students figure out um, how, how to make sense of this stuff for themselves? And so, um, and I think making those connections are so crucial. And I really like the way that you phrase this idea of, uh, that this is, that their their learning is very contextual um, and, because I think that's right. I think in certain they can recognize it in certain places, but if you change, you know how how they're how they're thinking about things, then they say, oh, I don't know how to do that, and when in fact they do. Um, so you know, kind of um, low stakes writing or or talking to peers or something like that in some way can help with some of that. I think because. Um, they don't know what they don't know, but they also don't realize that they know more than than <laughs> they give themselves credit for. Uh, and the other thing I would say is, is sort of piggybacking on this idea of um, contextualization. That I think the other thing that students uh, frequently do that hinders their abilities is they compartmentalize everything. And I think often they don't see how what they did in class A has any implications for what they're doing in class B. And so um, it's a similar but not exactly the same uh, problem uh, that also has content uh, issues as well. And I think one of the things that, that we have to do as instructors is be very blunt and upfront about why we are doing certain things. Um, over the last few years, I've, I've become uh, an advocate of uh, group learning and team-based learning. And what I've found is that, you know, there, there's always a, a set, subset of students who hate team or group uh, work. And you basically have to be very upfront about why you're doing it and how um, it's useful outside of the academic setting. Because um, a lot of students don't see as, you know, this is, part of why we're having this discussion, what they're do, how what they're doing in the classroom is useful for the, their life and, and work beyond. And, you know, we know from surveys of employers that they want people who can work in teams and want people who can work in groups. But often um, students don't see that that's a skill or set of skills that employers want. So I'm very upfront with my students uh, 
in a lot of my classes that we're working in teams because you're going to have to work in teams um, when you get a job, most likely. And you're not going to be able to pick your team. You're going to have to work with whoever else is hired and whoever else is on that particular job. So a lot of the uh, work we do is set up to sort of simulate the kind of things they might be doing um, when they get a job. Fantastic. All right, guys. Um, if you have any other quick last second questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, you can also always contact uh, Jamie and Bill. I put the link to the book in here uh, uh, in the chat box so that you can see the other chapters. We also have webinars on some of the other chapters coming up, such as on April 7th, the chapter on diversity, inclusion, and cultural awareness. Uh, there's also on April 21st, the final grade preparation in Canvas webinar. So if you uh, are still playing with Canvas Gradebook and you think that might be a good one for you, feel free to sign up for that as well. You can sign up for all of these at the teaching.uncc.edu website. And um, once again, uh, Jamie has put her email in the chat box so that you can contact her, Bill as well. Um, obviously, this is exactly the kind of conversation we want to have at this university and encourage and do. And this is just fantastic. So thank you again. And we appreciate your attending. And tell your friends about the recording. It'll be on CTL's website. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.